So the history, we're getting, getting into the history of Scream, and there's a lot. Now, uh, the year is 1996, Lacey, and uh, the Cold War has been over for five years. Uh, the conflict that defined the previous 50 years of American history, it was fading into the past. You know, for 50 years, it's hard to believe this now, but if you were living in the 80s, you could be like, is there a chance that communism becomes the default of philosophy guiding the world and the way that we relate to each other and to the state and to work uh, that it all changes? Oh my gosh. But no, that the communism loses. Capitalism is triumphant. Now the dominant mode of how we define ourselves is, is in terms of the consumer choices we make. American culture is fixated on spectacle and celebrity because we don't have a big enemy anymore. The OJ Simpson trial enthralls a nation. The internet is coming. Everybody knows it's coming. We don't know what it's going to do. We have a computer at our house and it's annoying and slow and there's not really much to do on it, but I know this is going to be big. Be sure to turn it on every day. Uh-huh. And then turn it off at the end of the day. Yeah, because you, you like to hear it. You like to hear it take its deep breath of home. Oh. And that's satisfying. You know you did good. Mm -hmm. And uh, the political system grinds to a halt to impeach a president over receiving a blowjob. It was the end of history. There were no more battles to be fought. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> At this point, we turn inward. We see a proliferation of movies and TV shows influenced by the broad range of philosophical movements categorized under the umbrella of postmodernism. We get The Simpsons. We get Seinfeld. We get Pulp Fiction. And now I have on screen for us a, a photograph of a McDonald's Big Mac. <sighs> Succulent. Beautifully photographed. Uh -huh. uh, it triggers in your mind, I would like a Big Mac, even as I'm aware I'm not looking at a Big Mac. I'm looking at an image of a Big Mac, not even an image of a Big Mac. I'm looking at a model of a Big Mac. Yep, that is that is the Cindy Crawford of Big Macs. Because, of course, a real <laughs> Big Mac, when you photograph, just looks like a real Big Mac. Why is the meat pink? We're inundated with images all day, every day, which mediate our experience of reality. And as John Baudrillard explains in his 1981 book, Simulacra and Simulation, uh, the relationship between the representations of reality and reality itself and how the former comes to overpower the latter, a word, an image, a sign represents a description of reality. But a simulacrum does not describe reality. It describes nothing at all. And there's four stages by which Baudrillard describes this happening. There is the sacramental order. There is the order of maleficence. There is the order of sorcery. And there is pure simulacra. Words, images, signs turn into simulacra, which represent nothing other than themselves and other simulacra. And now... Meaning... Giant leap here. Okay. Woo! Movies about movies. Okay. This, that was an expression of meta? I kind mean, of, a, a yeah. definition of. I mean, postmodernism means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But when postmodernism really, really takes hold of the culture in the 1980s and 1990s, meta becomes big, self reflexive movies that know that you, the audience, have seen movies before. Yeah. And so we're going to use your knowledge of movies and the rules that govern movies and the tropes of genres to trick you or to undermine you or to subvert your expectations. Even movies that you don't think of, like Batman from 1989, mm -hmm. like it opens with uh, the the first thing you see is, you know, a family leaving a theater. Oh. You follow them and you assume the viewer, I'm watching young Bruce Wayne. Right. about to, But no, it's a, a different unrelated family. And then Batman comes into the frame and the movie's playing with your expectations of how Batman movies work, or, or at least your expectations of what you're going to see in a Batman movie. Mm -hmm. And then, you know. The movie itself seems to be simultaneously taking place in the 1920s and the 1980s. So it's subverting your idea of like a movie is stuck in time. A movie takes place in a certain period of time. But this movie seems to be taking place in two or more different periods of time. I guess I just assumed that was a Batman thing, a Gotham thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a Tim Burton thing. Uh, it's both. It's both. Gotham's always seemed like uh, like in the future and in the past, like the buildings seem impossibly tall and it's clean and but yet it's never not foggy and it's never daytime. It's never <laughs> it's always been influenced by by film noir, which Tim right. Burton brought in. I think was the German expressionism and, right. and just the horror brutalism. The brut that was more of a Joel Schumacher thing. Dang it! Uh, with the, the big the big Atlas statues. Yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. Darn. Darny, darn, darn. But 
you know, in the eighties we get cable TV and we get VHSs and suddenly movie fans, their relationships to movies change because now we can watch movies on repeat. We can watch anything we want at any time. Do you know something? This is, I've never realized this because I've never thought of Scream as a movie about movies, which is stupid because I should. But then because of this, this popularity, they then make not another scary movie or scary movie, whatever they make, scary movie. Mm -hmm. So then get a movie about a movie that's a movie about a movie. Yes. And in the case of scary movie, a movie that is called what Scream was called while it was being produced. Cause Scream was scary. It was called scary movie oh, wow. while it was in development. It's like it was called stab. <laughs> Wait, no, that's what, that's what Scream calls the yes. movie about Scream in uh -huh. the next Jesus. And then scary movie is also is made by the same studio that made Scream. So it's like we make the thing and then we make the parody of the thing and we get you on both ends. Whoa. So exit through the gift shop. <laughs> yes, Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. A dismal land. This is amazing. Uh, Matt, the, you're taking me on a journey. The relationship that, you know, your film fan has, it moves from going to the cinema, going to repertory screenings and stuff. Now you're in your home or you're at the video store. You're communing with the video store clerk who has all this vast knowledge with a Quentin Tarantino type. Now you're not just seeing the big classics. You're seeing all of the, all of the entries in the genre. You get to see every good and bad and shitty and low budget and high budget horror movie and sci-fi movie and exploitation movie. It's a really a real moment of choice. I never thought about a movie store, a video store as that because they always existed for me. It feels like the thing that doesn't exist anymore because we have too much choice. But it was the start of that. I never thought about it. Like just blockbusters were what we had access to and direct to home things that were advertised on channels we watched. But what about all the other stuff that other people knew about that we didn't know about? And now we have infinite choice that feels like way less choice. Like we are, we have, we have so many options that the experience of having the options feels like we have fewer options than we went to a video store mm -hmm. and it was all laid out there before us. This is why I like to collect physical media. <laughs> yeah, me I too. I can remember there's a lot. Me too. So a uh, notable example from the mid nineties of a postmodern self-aware meta movie is Wes Craven's New Nightmare. This is 1994. This is two years before Scream. So Wes Craven, after he directed the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie in 1984, and then he was tangentially involved with Nightmare on Elm Street 3, he left the franchise. He viewed it as kind of a millstone around his neck. It was super successful. It made him very rich, but he's like, I. he was a guy who didn't just want to be a horror movie director. Is it easier to, to name directors who do just want to be i know it's <laughs> always the um john carpenter didn't uh i thought he had set out to do more just but i don't think he minded being mm. called the master of horror or being being identified as a horror if you're master. gonna be the master yes it's nice um you don't want to be like the henchman but of he, horror that's yeah i feel like all we talk about is directors who's like i never wanted to be pegged down as just a horror guy or the actors who actually break free because we always phrase it like that like they got their big start here no it's like they got out they knew mm -hmm. get the fuck out of there jamie's the one that got away it's true i mean that's just how it goes i mean if you're if you're successful in tv it's like yeah but can you make it in movies but don't you think now there's some real standouts um that just keep finding themselves in horror movies in the last few years, especially uh, Mia Goth, who, of course, they're going to be able, they'll do whatever they want. Like, it, there's something more prestige about horror. Horror movies seem to be more important than ever because maybe they're like the one thing that studios will still make that's not a superhero franchise movie or like the idea that is scary makes it a part of this bigger property rather than needing to actually be part of a or maybe that's just the independent scene is behind horror i don't know you know maybe that's there just seems to be more horror to watch that people actually go see so you can become a real star it's 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 the consistently successful at the box office genre mm -hmm. and usually it's it's lower budget and there's just generally an audience for it horror people will just go see horror movies it does almost doesn't matter it's not like that what it, it hasn't necessarily what's happened to all of movies you know the cliche you hear is people used to go to the movies now they go to see a movie right but want to go to the movies? Yeah, sure. What's playing? We'll find out when we yeah, get there. Yeah, I just go to the dollar show and we would just 
pick a movie while yes. we were there. I didn't and even in a way, it. horror movies are still kind of like that. There are people who will just, if there's a horror movie, I'll go see it. And that's kind of, that kind of doesn't exist for the other genres. But in that way, it feels a little siloed off. And if you become a star, you're a star in that world. And you'll go make a lucrative living doing cons and stuff. But you're not really part of our mainstream. But that's world. what I'm saying. I think that, that may be not true anymore because you look at uh, the star from Long Legs, who was also in Watcher or Watchers or whatever. The two movies we just happen to watch back to back with the same star in it. Yeah, Micah Monroe. Yeah, she seems she seems perfectly like mainstream and and good and interesting enough to do a drama and then maybe a comedy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I don't think you can go straight from her roles to rom com, but. I don't know. I guess I just feel like she's had enough publicity. It's not like these B movies and stuff where that's the places people get stuck. Yeah. To me, it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like at least we have horror actors anymore. It feels like anybody can be a horror actor. Yes. James McAvoy is leading, you know, uh, speak no evil. And he's just a regular, regular I feel like people movie are star. really getting like a kick out of it, though, with Josh Hartnett being a killer and then and Nicolas Cage being a bad guy and freaking Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth. He, when was who, a bad guy in Mad Max? Who was that? Oh, Chris Hemsworth. So don't say, uh uh-uh. uh. I was saying people who but are I, going against type and being in. Jo- I the, thought you were going to talk about a horror movie, though. You're talking about Furiosa. I still. Not a horror movie. I know, but I still named a guy who is real. You did name a guy who's real. Who doesn't usually pay, play a villain, and that was my point. Okay. So- I named three fucking actors in a row, and I got no dyslexia points from you. That's where I'm burnt up right now. No, I wrote them My down. My ass is chapped. I wrote them down. You I wrote- didn't let me have Mad Max. You're like, no, Hemsworth, no. I was so impressed when you said Mia Goth. There was a, only <sighs> a, like a second's hesitation, and you just said it. I just said you it. I like, went for it. You weren't like Mia Goth. Because it sounds made up. Mia Goth. Did Tim Burton draw her? All right, uh... Wes Craven leaves the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise behind, uh, but he returns for the seventh entry in the franchise. Wes Craven's new nightmare is what it's called. This one takes place in the real world and involves the actors from the first movie and Wes Craven playing himself Mm -hmm. uh, being haunted in the real world by Freddy Krueger as a new Freddy Krueger movie goes into production and it has them like revisiting sets from the first movie and inadvertently saying lines from the first movie. The film was polarizing for fans at the time. It was a financial disappointment because it wasn't just a normal nightmare on Elm street movie. And I think that, uh, there's probably an age divide for people who, you know, get it, who get the meta thing right. and, and people who are just confused by it. I remember learning on the Simpsons commentary that the episode Homer's enemy had like an age divide for people who hated it and people who loved it. And me is like the always Frank growing Grimes up. One? Yes. Is always growing up loving it. Like who wouldn't love it? But the, at I least the it. writers and producers and animators of the show said there was a certain kind of fan who just didn't understand the concept of inter of taking a person from the real world and having him be forced to work at the nuclear power plant with Homer and being confused by how this universe works. So it's like p- the people of our generation have sort of internalized the idea the the self reflexivity of postmodernism. We're living in Baudrillard's nightmare. We see only simulacra everywhere. And all we think about is how they interact with each other. But what we never do is think about reality. But we'll return to Wes Craven shortly. Bites millennial. Joke. You said it sister. Okay. All right. Kevin Williamson was the screenwriter of scream. He was 30 years old at the time he would go on to create Goss- Dawson's Creek. He wrote, wrote movies like that I know what right. you did last summer, which came out a year before Dawson's Creek is also set in North Carolina has a piece of geography named Joss Dawson's Cove or something. I just watched it last night. That's mm. why I noticed uh, the faculty. Uh, and then he went on to create the vampire diaries, uh, but he started his career as a soap opera actor and then transitioned into screenwriting. He took a UCLA screenwriting class. So he's like professionally taught the rules of screenwriting. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense that he would then be like, but what if this, uh, he sold his first script teaching Mrs. Kringle in 1995, but it wasn't produced at least until later it's a Christmas movie. No, it's a, it's like a killer movie. And then he started working on this horror movie script inspired by the serial killer, Danny Rowling, uh, also known as the Ripper who killed five college students in Gainesville. And he was house sitting one night while he was watching this TV special and he started to get freaked out, but then decided, wait a minute, maybe there's a movie here of someone being at home and scared. 
And also being in a house that's got too many doors and too many windows. There's a reason why that's the beauty of so, something that Scream does really well is pick the houses. You need circles. You need stairs. You need lots of doors to go through. You need rooms you don't expect to lead to other rooms that didn't then, that then push you outside for some reason. And for Drew Barrymore's house, it was important that she had three doors to lock. That's an excellent point. And, and I it's think all that, windows. I think that I've always, why I, why I don't hi, hold these movies in the esteem that I hold the other slasher movies is the slasher movies need an element of coziness. I want, I need to want to be in these houses and the houses in Scream all seem a little sterile uh, or, or just like big and uninviting. They're too just big. kind of big mansion-y. But that's the point that they are vast They're and you have scene. to feel while you're in them like you're a stranger in your own house. Like I shouldn't be here. So house sitting makes sense. Yes, exactly. Or or someone who isn't used to having the whole house to themselves because their mom and dad are out at the movies or their dad is way on business. Right. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you need to look small and feel small in and having all the access to the space always seems so weird to me. This idea of like, I'm going to have a party at my house and people who don't understand what these rooms are for are going to go in these rooms and use them the wrong way. And like, so when, when Nev and Billy go and have sex in Stu's mom's room, I'm like, that's not what that room's for. Ew. And you're smelling their smell while you're having your first dick in you. Ew. So I just love this idea of like foreign spaces that are for, that are other people's like private sanctity spaces oh my god though those are always in scary movies this is this is halloween yeah in our halloween episode we talked a lot about them having sex in the bed of the uh, under the covers under the covers of the jarvis's or the doyles i don't remember which and we're talking about how you're getting mr doyle's pubes on you oh yeah yeah ah yes Ah, yes but we'll talk more about how they have sex in the parents bedroom later we always seem to um america pre-financial collapse Everybody's like, you know, I make $35,000 a year working in an office and I can afford an 8,000 square foot home. We all feel like we're strangers in a strange land. We didn't like, this is too much. We don't actually earn it. And the corrections need it. are coming. Corrections in the form of ghost face. Come to get you. Yeah. With that kind of square footage, you need a housekeeper. Where, where is that housekeeper? <laughs> You didn't know what to do with that big house. So he completed the script for the movie he called Scary Movie in three days. He designed the opening scene of the movie to entice Hollywood execs because he knows this is what they're looking for when they read a script. And there became there, a little bidding war happened. And the project ended up at Miramax. And Miramax at the time, run by Harvey Weinstein, had a sister label, Dimension, which was run by Bob Weinstein. And it was for less prestige less Miramaxy movies. Mm-hmm. And then after Scream became a big hit, it basically just became the horror label. Okay, yeah, because uh, as, as soon as it comes on the screen, I'm like, ooh, something scary. Yes. And something quirky. So the project- Clever. Not the quirky, clever. So the project is offered to Wes Craven. He turns it down several times before accepting uh, because he's like, I don't want to do horror. I don't want to do slashers. I'm sad. But everything he's doing that isn't a slasher isn't working. And even New Nightmare didn't work very well. But I like this quote from Kevin Williamson in The Ringer's 2021 Oral History of Scream by Alan Siegel. So this is a quote from Kevin Williamson. And he says, quote, after he, Wes, Signed on, I was going to his house for lunch and I was like, oh, I'm going to go to his house. This is super cool. I want to see how a big hotshot movie director lives. And so I get in my car and I get lost driving up and I'm already late. And then I show up. He has all these pages of notes from my script and I just see them sitting there on a table. And I'm like, oh no, this is going to be horrible. He's going to want to change everything. I've heard of these horror stories. I know what happens now. This is the moment I get kicked to the curb. I mean, I've always lived in fear of that. And then it turned out that he was like, well, most of these are typos. There was a bunch of typos. He goes, we should just fix everything, don't you think? Uh, It was a really great meeting because it was my first time with a director who was clearly taking the written word and starting to visualize it. He was turning, he was starting to turn it into pictures. He was starting to paint on a canvas, end quote. Uh, Wes Craven, who was 56 when he directed Scream and he died in 2015, uh, started out his career in academia, got a degree in philosophy, master's degree in philosophy from Johns Hopkins University, and he taught high school English, which explains all the notes about typos. Well, we really do sometimes get a, a good connective tissue happening through our movies. It's so often that we will watch two movies in a row where you then have the same poster for some reason mm-hmm. two or three times. Uh, 
in in our PowerPoints. It's we, we do not intentionally do it. Okay, so he was also involved um, with the last house, house on the left, yes. which was also written by Todd Phillips, Sean Sean, Sean Cunningham of, of Friday the Thirteenth, and they were. But why did it was on the Todd Phillips? No, it was on the Friday the Thirteenth Part Two episode. Oh. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Um, but he, he decided he wanted to work in film and he went to New York and worked in basically any, on any movies he could in any job they would offer him. He did sound engineering. He did editing. He would write, he would produce, he did industrial films. He did pornographic films. And then with his friend, Sean Cunningham, they independently, independently made the last house on the left. His follow-up was the Hills have eyes in 1977. He directed a swamp thing movie in 1982. And then the big one nightmare on Elm street in 1984, Oh, that you don't have one here. I figured I didn't even need it. I thought you'd say, and then the big one, The People Under the Stairs. <laughs> was that the big one? People Under the Stairs is really good, though. Yeah, I've heard good things. So, yeah, it's it's an enormous hit. He wrote it, he directed it, it spawns a hugely profitable franchise. I'm sure he got super rich because of it. And he always had success making horror movies, but he was one of these guys. He's like, but I want to do real movies. So he like... But can you? Made a Meryl Streep movie called Music of the Heart. Ugh. And... Yeah, it's so weird. It's I like it's Meryl a Street. it's a drama film directed by Wes Craven. Do you think that like because he would have grown up in like the time where uh hot um water beds are cool, do you think like to impress a girl he definitely wears the Freddy hands and then gets in the bed and then Absolutely. Absolutely just ruins the night. One thousand percent pop. I think he has like a closet full of, I think like how just I have deflated, generation Y bookmarks. Deflated water beds in his, his deflated closet. Deflated water beds, yes. Because he's like, don't bring the hand in the bed, Wes. Mm-hmm. Don't bring the hand. There we go. Will dude carpet again. They finally signed Wes Craven and they signed Drew Barrymore on to play Sydney, Sydney Prescott. Here's a quote from Kevin Williamson. Quote, when it finally got time to go into production, Drew was like, I just really want to be in the opening scene. That's the part I love the most. And I was happy to hear that because I always saw it as a sort of the Janet Lee opening. Uh, Janet Lee, if you don't know, is, is from Psycho. Uh, is is presented as the main character of the movie. <laughs> what were you doing? I was doing Friday the 13th too. Oh. <laughs> Janet Lee, who has a sexy nightmare in the bed. And oh, then is yes. Murdered. No. That's, I thought it was an homage to that. That's not her name. It was not an homage to the, No, that's uh, that's Adrian King as Alice. That's what I said. Um. Yeah, Janet Lee presented as the star of Psycho, the big, the big face on the poster, mm. the most famous person in the movie. The person who is in every shot of the movie and then gets killed 40 minutes in. Uh, Yes. Okay. So you wanted the biggest quote. You wanted the biggest star to be in the first moment of the movie. That's why the scene is so long because I wanted to keep Casey Becker alive just long enough where you think she's the lead of the movie and that she's going to survive this moment. It ended up just working out beautifully because that Drew liked that part. And then we could cast whoever we wanted for Sydney. End quote. And yeah, we were looking at the poster and trying to figure out who is the giant face it's but the, the cheats because it blue eyes just pop more on the poster, but Drew Barrymore has brown eyes, so that's why I didn't know it was Drew Barrymore. But yeah, it's a photoshopped Drew Barrymore, and I, I was looking like somebody's like, no, and here's the picture it was taken from. There's like a series of headshots of Drew mm. Barrymore, and uh, it but, looks like her once you said it. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So she's she has the biggest face on the poster, and then just in the normal lineup with the other characters, she's right there in the front. Mm-hmm. They also do alphabetical billing, so it's David Arquette, Drew Barrymore. Nev Campbell. Smart. That's smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I Before I saw the movie, I assumed this was a Drew Barrymore movie. Now I have a story that comes from the book, Down in Dirty Pictures, and then we'll be done with the history. Uh, but I just really liked this story. So Bob Weinstein, who was, you know, he's the good Weinstein. He's the one who didn't do his brother's crimes. And I'm sure he had nothing to do with any of those crimes. Uh, but... His 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 meddlesome, more famous brother was always getting involved, and now now Bob Weinstein is is starting to produce movies like his brother, and he decides I, I need to put my stink on here where I can. So from the book Down and Dirty Pictures by Peter Biskin, Bob said, "I'm scared. I don't know about this." He started picking at details. Why was Drew Barrymore wearing a sweater? Shouldn't it be racier? Her wig looks terrible. Carrie Granite, who headed Dimension, was a friend of Conrad's. Conrad is a producer. Uh, he warned her, Bob is not happy. This isn't going to get better. It's going to get worse. She replied, what do you want me to do? There was no answer. One day, Craven was shooting a scene with Lee F. Schreiber, who was doing a cameo as Cotton Weary, and Bob called the set, said, let me talk to Wes. Conrad inter- interrupted Craven in the middle of a shot and said, Bob wants to talk to you, she recalls. Bob told him that he thought Wes could do better. Wes said to me, 
what kind of studio head calls a filmmaker in the middle of shooting and kicks him in the balls and expects him to be able to work the rest of the day and do good work. Bob did that? Yeah. The good one? The good one, yes. Yes, but I like that he points out, like, yeah, I, if I ever get a shitty email from a client on a Sunday, I'm like, couldn't you just wait until Monday and my Monday could have been ruined, but now my Sunday's also ruined? How am I supposed to go back to work and direct actors and be like, okay, also, Nav. Also, it's the nightmare fucking client of, like, do better any direction, any kind of direction at all. Do happy. Do sexy. D- this make me sad. Like, j- say any other words i don't know what you're saying is bad yeah and so he keeps saying like well what what's not working for you what are you scared what what's what's making you nervous what would you rather see right and like it's just not working it's just not working what part he had specific things whenever he was talking to the other guy so they say like we're we're coming we're gonna fly out there and, oh, and Wes craven's like fine come out here i'm just gonna shit blood everywhere so as a bystander one issue that, that Bob Weinstein has is with the mask. He thinks it looks too goofy. And they're like, but we, you approved the mask. You approved the mask. And he's like, but we didn't design this mask. And they're like, but you approved this mask. The point is it's a mask that you can just buy at a store. Yes. And then Bob Weinstein later said, like, I didn't realize that like in Halloween, they just purchased the mask from a store either. Um, but he doesn't know which mask he wants. And so here's what they said, quote, Bob wants Wes to continue filming, shooting each scene with four different masks <gasps> until he can decide which one he wants. Uh, and he was Show being told the to go to hell. So then they send the exact. Show me the masks. We don't have pictures of these other masks. No. Oh, tell me one was a stormtrooper. So Bob sends his guy down to the shoot. Uh, Cary Granite is the, is Bob's guy. So quote, in any event, Granite got on a plane from California. When he arrived, he convened a meeting in Craven's hotel room at midnight that included Conrad, the line producer and a couple of assistants announcing we have reached an impasse. He told them how they could pl- placate Bob. Conrad thought he was being disrespectful to Craven interrupted interrupting. She exploded with, wait a second. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? You hired a guy who created the genre basically. And you're telling him how to make the movie. The guy's made 30 some odd movies. This is the most insulting thing I've ever seen in my entire fucking life. And frankly, you're not offering us any help. You're just telling us how to keep beating around the bush until someone who's invisible decides they like what they see. This is no way to make a movie. It's going to cost a fortune. It's stupid. And we're not going to do it. Who said that? The, the Cravens producer, a lady. Yes. A lady. Yeah. That's what that's that's what a producer does. You fucking stand up to the studio and you say, we're not going to take your shit. I didn't know that. Yeah. I want to be a producer. Just well, kidding. Yeah. I want everyone to like me. Yes. <laughs> you can be a good producer or a bad. You can be the good producer or the evil producer. There's like two different kinds. Yeah. Basically work, work, on, work for the for the filmmakers side or work for the studio side. Sounds like Wes Craven has his people. He does. Yes. Sounds like a nice guy. Because then uh, the book's like to which Wes, Wes responded. Yeah. Aww. Um, basically what they offer to do is <laughs> you're fucking the slides title is dumb. And I love it. Bob Weinstein became happy. Okay. Well, the earlier one was Bob Weinstein was not happy. Got Bob it. Weinstein became happy. Mm-hmm. Or Weinstein. They offer basically, okay. The only we'll put together an assembly of the 40 minutes or so We'll send it and you watch it. And right there, you'll determine our fate. Are we going to keep going? If you like it, you leave us alone. If you don't like it, we pull the plug on everything. Quote, okay. they cut together what they had, sent it to Miramax and continued shooting, pacing back and forth in front of the production office, wondering, are we going to live or are we going to die? Conrad took a call from one of Bob's assistants who gave her an Elvis has entered the building play by play of the proceedings. The footage is in the office. The footage is on its way down to the screening room. The footage has reached the projection booth. The footage is being threaded. Bob is on his way down. Harvey is now with Bob. They're both seated. The lights have gone out. They're starting. I'll call you back. Conrad was shaking. Craven poked his head in three or four times asking, have you heard? Have you heard? Then 10 minutes later, Bob called Conrad. He said, that was fucking great. That was fucking great. Harvey levitated across the theater. It was unbelievable. Jesus Christ. You guys were right. I was wrong. I was so wrong. It's fucking amazing. Anything you guys want, anything. She recalls, that was it. We never heard from him again. I have to say it was one of the greatest calls I've ever received from a studio chairman in my life, end quote. And what are your thoughts as soon as you hear that, Matt? Show me the 10 minutes. What did he see? I want to know what they shot and you got to see. I think it just what part? the first 40 minutes of the movie. They like, don't in shoot a, in, in order. Rough, no, I know, but the, we have enough footage to put together for you this stretch of the movie. I think they said they sent 40 minutes. I assume it would have been the stretch of them. But they only watched 10 and they were like, that's great. That's great. Yeah. 
Well, that opening scene and, and I, it is the best part of the movie. I, I think it is I don't kind agree, of, but I just, you know, it's like, it's the most, it's probably the most iconic and it's amazing and it sets the tone, but I am so relieved to see these, um, uh, more, I don't know these, these kids. I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to see Nev after all that. Like, Oh, look at her. Yeah. Cause it's so tense. That's why it's good. I know it's good. It's just not my favorite part of the movie. All right. Well, my favorite part of the movie is the ending. Yeah. It's the kitchen stuff. That's my second favorite and part. And the butt stuff. The butt stuff. There's no butt stuff. I just wanted to say butt That's stuff. That's the only thing that can make the movie better. Um, all right. Well, Lacey thinks it's the second best part. I think it's the first best part. Way in. Hashtag one. Hashtag two. And uh, that's all the history we're going to get in now. <laughs> And we're going to get individually into history of each act or have things to say about each actor as we go through the actual yes, because story. These people so mean don't a get lot worried to you people. I know. So if you're watching this in, in, in on YouTube, because we just put the history up because it was a thick and rich task text. And I think Matt should put it as an individual video. Please do not shoot yourself in the foot and don't watch the second part. Yeah. Just click the link on your screen it's right, right there. now. It's fucking right there. Or there, or there. I don't know how this shit works. I'll bet it's here. It's in a direction. Yeah. All right. 